Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Middle East Teaching and Learning Conference. My name is Dr. Sarah Mead Jaspers, and I will be leading a session titled The Good Behavior Game and Other Easy to Implement Classroom Management Strategies. Here is our plan for the session. First, we'll do an introduction and talk about some logistics. Then we'll get into some background about applied behavior analysis or ABA, well-being and classroom management. Then we'll move to talk about some healthy behavioral practices, the good behavior game, and check in check out procedures before we wrap up for today. So let's start with an introduction. First, an introduction of me. Again, my name is Dr. Sarah Mead Jaspers. I'm a board certified behavior analyst at the doctoral level. I'm also a licensed elementary school teacher. Currently, I'm an assistant professor at Emirates College for Advanced Education in Abu Dhabi. I'm originally from the United States and first moved to Abu Dhabi in 2007, and I've been in my current role since 2020. Relevant to today's presentation, I have a strong interest in evidence-based strategies for well-being and classroom management. Some logistics for today, even though this is a pre-recorded session, I will ask a few questions to get discussion going in the chat, so please feel free to participate. Likewise, I will be available myself in the live chat to answer questions during the session. Further inquiries always can be sent to me afterwards by email at sarah.mead at ecae.ac.ae. I'll share that again at the end. And if you're interested in finding any of the references used in today's presentation, you can do that by scanning the QR code for the reference list. I also would like to take a moment to recommend a related session that's being led by my colleague, Dr. Michelle Kelly. Her session is titled Practical Strategies to Improve Student Learning in Every Classroom. Now, both Dr. Michelle and I will be talking about behavior analytic approaches in the classroom. I'm focusing more on kind of more typical classroom management strategies to increase pro-social behavior and decrease disruptive behavior, while Dr. Michelle will be talking about some evidence-based instructional strategies such as choral responding, response cards, guided notes, staff beds, etc., that also often have resulting increases in pro-social behavior and decreases in disruptive behavior when effective instructional strategies are used. So if you have not already, I recommend checking out Dr. Michelle's presentation as well. So let's get into some of today's content, starting with applied behavior analysis or ABA. Now, if we had more time, I would play this video for you. It's a couple minutes long. Um, if you would like to watch it yourself on your own time, you can scan that QR code and it's on a website hosted by the Behavior Analyst Certification Board. The ABA is a science-based approach to behavior and learning, talking about all human behavior, not just human behavior in the classroom, but ABA has been used in a variety of fields, such as interventions related to autism spectrum disorder, gerontology or working with elderly people, organizational behavior management, working with employees, and relevant for today's talk, a lot of work has been done in education and classrooms and student learning. When we're talking about ABA, we are talking about an approach to looking at behavior that is measurable. So we're looking at behaviors that we can observe, behaviors that we can count. We're looking at behaviors that are socially significant. So in the classroom, Behaviors that we might want to see more of our students are um, completing work, engaging with the materials, sharing with friends, all of those types of academic as well as social behaviors. ABA is strongly based on research. None of the, the practices that we're going to suggest, um, they're all evidence-based and they all have a strong research foundation. We also, data is an incredibly important part of ABA interventions. We're always collecting data to ensure that behaviors are changing in the way that we're hoping that they will. Um, so pro-social behaviors are increasing and disruptive behaviors are decreasing. That's because we want to make sure that we're making meaningful change. We're actually increasing well-being, increasing safety, increasing academic output, whatever our target may be. And we want to make sure that we're generalizing that behavior change. So it's not just that we're teaching one skill in one classroom, but we're actually teaching students skills that can be used across classrooms as well as at home and in the community. So if you want to learn more about ABA, again, here's another QR code to take you to another website that tells you more about ABA. When we get into ABA and education specifically, um, this is a subspecialty of ABA, and there are lots of sub areas. So I'm going to be primarily um, focusing on that top bullet point, classroom management. Dr. Michelle will be touching on some of the others, but you can see 
that the ABA approach to education goes across a, a lot of different core components of a classroom, all the way down to, to teacher education and how we prepare new teachers to be in the classroom. Important to me in the work that I do is how to capitalize on and utilize ABA to increase well-being. So here's the intersection to me between ABA and well-being. Now, well-being is an umbrella term that I'm using that has meaning in many aspects of a person's life. So we might talk about social well-being, physical well-being, emotional, cognitive, spiritual. It's not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea. There are all of these areas to make us a, a whole person, right? But when you break it down and you look at these different areas, you'll see that a lot of them have to do with behavior. So I'm gonna add some red highlights here. So something like social well-being, we experience positive relationships. Let's break that down. How do we do that? Probably by engaging in some behaviors and not engaging in other behaviors. Maybe we learn to ask questions about other people. Maybe we learn to not bully other people. These are all really important parts of developing our own social well-being, looking at emotional well-being, self-awareness. Those are skills that we have to learn, behaviors that we have to learn. So if we can actually teach children how to engage or not engage in certain behaviors related to aspects of well-being, we can have a pretty profound impact on the well-being that they're experiencing. Now, certainly ABA cannot address all aspects of well-being. That's where a whole child approach and interdisciplinary teams are necessary. But ABA can target the classroom environment to create a safe and productive space for learning by promoting pro-social behavior, decreasing disruptive behavior, and utilizing effective teaching practices. So I'll be focusing on the, the increasing pro-social and decreasing disruptive behavior. Well, Dr. Michelle is focusing a lot in her presentation on those effective teaching practices to do that. So let's move on to some healthy behavioral practices that can help to promote that well-being. So what are healthy behavioral practices? I first want to be clear that it's not a curriculum. There's no guidebook. Um, it, it is a rather a thoroughgoing approach to classroom behavior and how we think about behavior. So it's not a single strategy or procedure or intervention, but rather kind of a conceptualization of behavior. So the, the core question becomes, why do students engage in disruptive behavior in the school context or the classroom context? And our answer here would be every behavior has a purpose, whether it's pro-social or it's disruptive, it, it serves a purpose. And there are two main categories that we tend to find behavior falling into. Behavior that students engage in to get things they want, get access to something. So they engage in behavior to get attention from teacher, from peers, from parents, or to get access to preferred items or activities. They also may engage in certain behaviors to try to get out of things they don't like, to escape them, something like difficult tasks or non-preferred activities or unpleasant interactions. So knowing that, how can healthy behavioral practices help? Number one, by disrupting the relationship between disruptive behavior and its purpose. So we want them to learn that disruptive behavior no longer provides access to preferred things or escape. We also want to try building a relationship between pro-social behavior and a purpose. We want them to learn that appropriate behavior can equal access to preferred items or escape. And here we really, you'll see it in the next couple slides, over and over, put the focus on promoting that pro-social behavior. Now there are four healthy behavioral practices we're gonna go over today. Those are providing positive interactions, providing access to preferred items and choice, providing effective instructions, and engaging in good practices following disruptive behavior. Now, you're probably looking at those lists and nodding, hopefully, uh, because I bet that you do a lot of these things in your classroom. I'm hoping that this can become a little bit like a mini community of practice in the chat. So I have some questions throughout, which is an opportunity for you to share some of the good things you're already doing in terms of each of these healthy behavioral practices. So please feel free to share your educator wisdom with us in the chat. So related to positive interactions, I usually break those down into two types. The first one is general positive interactions. The saying I think of here is just, I see you. This is just acknowledging our students, you know, greeting them when they come in in the morning, letting them know that you see them and you know that they're there, you care about them, asking them how they are, 
talking to them about what's important to them. Sorry, it just quit, but I'm going to just open it back up so we don't have to restart. Um, and giving them a, a chance to chat with you and talk about what they're enjoying and, and just getting to know them as a person. So that's the, the first type of positive interaction. The second type of positive interaction is a specific descriptive praise for a certain behavior that you caught them doing. So the phrase that I like to use here is caught you being good. Um, so here you have identified that they've engaged in a specific pro-social behavior and you call them out on it. You say, nice job coming to class with all of your materials prepared. I really appreciate that you got here on time or a couple minutes early and kind of filling them up with those good positive interactions. So here's your first live chat question. Feel free to type in the chat. And that is how do you promote positive interactions in your classroom? Next up is providing access to preferred items and choice. So what to do? Um, this is providing students with a choice of preferred items and activities. Now, clearly, um, there are some things that you end up doing in, in school that you don't want to do. But as much as possible, we want to be able to provide choice related to it. So we try to do it whenever possible, but especially during downtimes or transitions or after appropriate behaviors. And we want to do it because students who have enough access to preferred items and activities, they don't need to engage in disruptive behavior to get more. They already have it. They already have a choice. And to decrease times of idle waiting. That's when we see a lot of challenging behavior happen is when there's nothing else that they're supposed to be doing. So we want to build that relationship again of appropriate behavior equals preferred items. You can see here a, a sample choice board. So if someone finishes their work early, they can go to the choice board and and choose something to do while they wait for their classmates to finish. So here's your next question. Um, I'd love to hear from you is how you provide choice in your classroom. Do you provide options during instructional times? Um, do you have other ways that you incorporate choice? Moving on to the third healthy behavioral practice, that is providing effective instructions. I'm sure that many of you do this already, so I think these will probably be reminders. We want to try to give simple and clear instructions in a pleasant tone of voice. We want to focus on do rather than don't request. So if um, students, let's say, um, rocking back in my chair, um, instead of saying, Sarah, don't rock in your chair, you can give me an instruction that says, Sarah, please put your chair on the floor, or even better, redirect me to the task that I'm supposed to be doing. You want to try to incorporate errorless learning. That's where Dr. Michelle's techniques will really come in as well. So we want to do it pretty much whenever an instruction is given, but especially when we're giving instructions about a new or a difficult task. And we do it for a couple of reasons, to try to decrease the difficulty or the aversiveness of a task, and to help, again, build a, a good relationship between appropriate behavior, so complying with the task, and then you get to take a break after you've finished your work. So once again, I'd love to hear from you. Um, tips and tricks about how you deliver effective instructions in your classroom. Meanwhile, I will move on to good practices following disruptive behavior. Now, this one's tricky. I'm going to break it down into two types of, of disruptive behavior. The first one is minor disruptive behavior. This is something that the student is engaging in that's not unsafe. Um, it's not necessarily disrupting other students. Just sometimes we call it junk behavior. It's just something they shouldn't be doing, um, but it, it's not too severe, if you will. Here, the recommendation is not to provide any attention after the behavior or comment about it. Definitely don't withdraw any instructions you've given. And as soon as the behavior stops, go right back to healthy behavioral practices one through three. And the idea here is that we want to break that relationship, disrupt it, so that disruptive behavior no longer accesses attention or escape. Now, there may be times where there's major disruptive behavior, something that truly is unsafe or um, not okay to be occurring in a classroom. So we want to try to make ma the major problem behavior, address that without letting it serve its purpose. So follow the practices for minor disruptive behavior. Intervene if you have to, but do so with minimal attention. And then just give it 10 seconds and return to healthy behavioral practice one through three. So some important reminders. Remember to provide high quality attention, 
access to preferred items and activities, and effective instructions when disruptive behavior is not occurring. That is, healthy behavioral practice for only works if one through three are in effect. And as a reminder, our main goals, we want to break the relationship between disruptive behavior and its purpose. So disruptive behavior no longer gets access to attention or, or fun things or, or no longer gets access to escape and build a relationship between pro-social behavior and a purpose. So teach that appropriate behavior can help them access attention, access preferred items or escape things. So those healthy behavioral practices are really just ways to think about behavior in your classroom overall and respond accordingly. Let's move into the good behavior game. So now the good behavior game, we're getting a little more specific. So this is a specific class-wide approach to promoting pro-social behavior and discouraging disruptive behavior. So here I am gonna give you kind of a set of instructions on how to do it. It incorporates the basic principles of ABA and the healthy behavioral practices. I think that you'll see some of those throughout. So the good behavior game was originally developed in 1969. Um, and it encourages healthy competition to engage in pro-social behavior through the use of positive reinforcement. There's over 50 years of research to support both the immediate and the long-term effects of the GBG. Now, again, if we had more time, I'd, I'd show you this whole video. I think he does a really nice job of talking through the history of, and how the game is played and what the outcomes can be. But the, the basic premise is that you break your, game, your class into a couple of teams Whenever you're getting ready to teach a lesson, let's say you're teaching a lesson about the periodic table. So you say, all right, we're gonna be doing a less a science lesson today. We're gonna play the good behavior game during it. Break your class into teams, two to four teams, and they're gonna compete against each other to see who can engage in the most pro-social behavior. So they're earning points for engaging in pro-social behavior, again, while you're teaching. And at the end of the game, there's gonna be some winners who get access to some rewards in the classroom. That's the basic overview. I'll go through it kind of step-by-step step with you in a moment though. If you are someone like me who loves research, um, here are some good places to start to learn about the good behavior game. All of these references will be in the reference list with the QR code. So you're welcome to take a look at any of these yourself. But here's an overview. Now there's a lot of bullet points here and I actually have a slide for each bullet point. So I'm not gonna pause too long here, but this is kind of your recipe, if you will, on how to play the good behavior game in your classroom. So let's go through it one by one. First, you need to identify and define behaviors for the good behavior game. So what do you wanna see your students do more of? You wanna select behaviors that are observable and measurable. Something you can also observe while you're teaching. So something like raising a hand before answering the question. And I have a non-example here of being a good friend. Now, obviously that's a good thing to do, right? Being a good friend, it's a good thing. However, it's a little hard to define. What does it mean to be a good friend? So to, to actually put it into the good behavior game, we have to break it down a little bit more and be very specific. Can we see it? Can we count it? We also want behaviors with a clear start and finish. So something like remaining silent during the allowed time. And I recommend you start with only a few behaviors, probably no more than three. You can add more later if you want to. So chance for you to chat with each other in the live chat. Um, let us know what behaviors you might, might, might like to see more of in your classroom. What would be helpful if you saw more of a certain pro-social behavior? Next is to determine how points will be earned. You have a few options here, so you can choose your own adventure. Option one is to break the good behavior game into some shorter intervals, maybe five minute intervals, and deliver points at the end of each interval. So each student who followed that rule for the whole interval earns a point for their team. So if the rule was stay in your seat, let's say you're doing a lesson that requires them to be at a table to manipulate tabletop activities, so one of the rules is going to be stay in your seat at your table so you can use the materials. So everyone who stayed in their seat for that whole five minutes, they earn a point for their team. That's one option. Another option, option two, is to discreetly set some sort of vibrating timer for a short period of time and then deliver points again at the end of the interval. But just if they're following the rules right then. So your timer goes off and you say, all right, pause. You look around everyone who's in their seat right then, they get a point for their team. Then you reset the timer for a different length and, and repeat. 
The third option, this is probably the least used option. Um, this is whenever a student follows a rule, you deliver a point. So it's a little hard for something like staying in your seat because you'd just be delivering points the whole time, right? Um, so it works best for target behaviors that are really brief and they can occur without being disruptive. So something like sharing materials after a request. So you, after you've picked how your points will be earned, then you determine when the GBG will be played. For it to work effectively, it needs a clear start and end time. So you're going to play from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock or whatever. Recommendation here is to start with relatively short sessions. Start with your most problematic times of the day. If there's a certain subject or certain time of the day where you see the most disruptive behavior, start then. After you see some progress, you can slowly extend the time. So here's another chance for you to chat. Um, let us know when you think GBG could be useful in your classroom. Are there specific subjects, times of day, lessons, et cetera, that you'd like to see pro-social behavior increase and disruptive behavior decrease? Next, you need to determine the criteria for winning the GBG. Once again, you have some options. So one option is at the end of the GBG session, the team with the most points wins. Good old fashioned competition. You have the most points, you're the winner. Option two is actually a chance where everyone could win. So now at the end of the GBG session, all the teams that have more than a preset number of points, they win. So let's say all teams who earned more than 20 points, they win the game. This has to be set and communicated at the start to the students though, so they know what type of winning we're looking at. Now, you know your students better than anyone, so use your judgment here. Uh, you have to think about whether the competition that you're seeing in option one is good. Uh, for some classes, it's great. For other classes, it's not. Option two, um, you may also want to start with a low number, like everyone who has more than five points wins, and then increase that slowly. Next, you get to decide what reinforcers will be earned for winning the game. So consider using a variety of reinforcers, access to special privileges, opportunities for preferred activities, tangible items, and kind of be creative here. Um, I think some people think that you have to have like a toy box or a reward box that they pick out of, but sometimes things like, let me go to the next slide, I like this one, using the teacher's chair. Sometimes that's an amazing reward and it doesn't cost you any money, it doesn't disrupt your class. So I'd love to hear from you what you think appropriate and desired rewards would be for the GBG in your classroom. While you're thinking about that, we'll talk about dividing the class into teams, probably two to four teams. And you wanna provide some sort of visual reminder of team memberships, maybe colored mats, maybe colored wristbands, and make sure that you have somewhere to record points like a whiteboard or an easel or something. Definitely be mindful of social dynamics. Again, you know your students the best, especially when you begin using the GBG. Make your teams roughly even in terms of um, the expected rule following of each team. Then you, it's your choice on how to change up teams later on. You could keep the same teams for a semester. You could change it every time. That's totally up to you. Now, once you've made all those decisions, you get to explain the rules of the GBG to your class. So describe behaviors that will earn points, describe how those points are earned, how they're recorded, describe how the teams will win, describe the reinforcers they can earn and how you'll deliver them. Make sure they fully understand all the rules. Then play. Uh, so start your lesson. So during that GBG session, you're going to follow your instructional academic lesson plan. You want to encourage enthusiasm for the GBG, but don't let it distract from academics. So while you're teaching, you'll be observing student behavior, delivering points according to the contingencies, so putting quick tally marks on the board. Definitely praise students when you catch them following the rules, even if it's not time for points. You can point out what you see them doing well. If disruptive behavior occurs, just like in healthy behavioral practices, don't draw attention to it. If you have to attend to it, do it as discreetly as possible. Once they've, the game is finished, they've earned their reinforcers, it is critical that they have immediate contingent access to those. So as soon as they finish the game, review all the points earned by each team, review how the points were earned, and focus on the behaviors that got them there. For the winning team, provide enthusiastic praise and provide access to those reinforcers. Now, if it's something like 
eating lunch with a teacher that can occur right then, uh, my recommendation is to make some sort of uh, certificate or note that they can actually receive at the end of the game and then trade into you when it's time to get the reinforcer. And then to wrap up by reminding the students that points will reset for next time and anyone can win next time. It, it's not cumulative. It restarts tomorrow or in the afternoon. Now I talked about data when we talked about ABA. So data is very important for the GBG. So object, objective data is required to tell us if adjustments are needed. So here's a, a pretty simple way to collect your data. You've collected points already, so you actually collected the data. So my suggestion is to add all the points together for all the teams and divide the points by the number of minutes in the session. So if you played a 10 minute session, divide it by 10 and then enter those data into a graph. So here's a fake graph that I made up that shows each day the GBG is played and how many points were earned per, per minute. Now you'd love to see a graph like this where you see the line go up because that means that pro-social behavior is increasing in your classroom. Some advanced recommendations if you love data as much as me, um, you could collect baseline data for comparison. You could make separate graphs for each behavior. You could collect behavior on disruptive behavior. Now, don't draw attention to those behaviors, but it could be interesting to collect data and see if disruptive behavior is decreasing. Now, some tips for troubleshooting the GBG. Um, if it's not working, you may want to return to your list of procedures, see if you can identify what could be reworked. It also is possible that individualized interventions might be needed. There might be students who need more support, which is what we'll talk about next. And you can also seek consultation and supervision, a great time to call in your friendly behavior analyst um, to give you a second set of eyes on what you're doing. Now, if this is interesting, you want to learn more, you want more resources, um, this website, the Good Behavior Game website at the American Institutes for Research is a great place to start and this QR code will take you there. So that was a quick overview of the Good Behavior Game, and we are almost out of time. So we're going to do a quick talk about the check-in, check-out procedures. So healthy behavioral practices are kind of the, the practices, how we should conceptualize disruptive behavior based on ABA. Then Good Behavior Game is a class-wide specific way to do that. Check-in, check-out is a, an individualized way to do that. So this is ideal for specific students who need extra support. So this is an individualized approach to promoting pro-social behavior and discouraging disruptive behavior. Again, incorporating the basic principles of ABA and healthy behavioral practices. And this works by teaching the student to be responsible and accountable for their own behavior. The basic components involve the student checking in with an adult, maybe a teacher, social worker, um, support teacher at the start of the day and picking up their tracking sheet. Now their tracking sheet is essentially a self-monitoring data sheet to see how they're doing following their rules in each setting. The student and an adult record feedback on the tracking sheet throughout the day. So it helps the student learn to self-monitor by comparing what they observed about their own behavior to what the adult in the room observed about their behavior. They check out with the adult at the end of the day and summarize their progress towards their goals um, for each of these behaviors. Once they've met their goals, maybe 80% following them for the week, 100% following for the week, then they get reinforcers or rewards, just like healthy behavior, just like good behavior game. So here's a live chat question for you. Um, now don't violate any confidentiality, but think about some students in your classroom. What are some individualized goals that might help a student in your classroom? For example, do you have a student who struggles with being on time or a student who struggles having materials ready or telling the truth, et cetera? Any of these things that might need more individualized attention, feel free to share those in the chat while I show you an example of what this might look like. So this is clearly made for probably an early elementary primary school student. On the left side, you see the goals for this student, following directions quickly, keeping their hands to themselves, and using nice words. Across different times of the day, I assume backpack time is kind of when you come in and put all your stuff down, morning message time, center's time, and library time, and something else, I don't know what it is. Now, on each of these times, the student is going to rate whether they met the goal, 
they'd circle the green smiley. They had one or two problems with the goal. They'd circle the yellow face or they didn't meet the goal. They'd circle the red face. Now they're going to select what they think and then the adult is gonna compare with them. At the end of the day, they'll write comments and check out to bring it home. Then at the end of the week, that would be when they would earn reinforcers for um, lots and lots of green smiley faces. Now there are many different approaches. I'm gonna go through these kind of fast because so you can follow the QR code to look for examples yourself, um, but they don't have to be fancy. This clearly is for someone uh, much older, maybe a kind of middle school, high school, secondary school student. Uh, here's another one. Again, these are things that you could just make on your own computer. They don't have to be, you don't have to be a graphic designer to do it. But it's a way to, to help support in an efficient way some of the students who may just need that little extra check-in time. Now, quick conclusion and wrap up. So we've gone through you know, three different ways of looking at behavior in the classroom. We started with healthy behavioral practices, this being a thoroughgoing approach to classroom behavior. Uh, thinking about the fact that every behavior serves a purpose. Some of them serve to access attention or items. Some of the behaviors serve the purpose to escape things. And we wanna try to promote um, pro-social behavior to access those things. Then we talked about the good behavior game, which was a specific class-wide approach to classroom behavior. And then we moved on to talk about the check-in, check-out procedure, a specific individualized approach to classroom behavior. So you got a little bit of theory, foundational stuff, class-wide stuff, as well as individualized stuff. So I hope that this session was helpful to you. I hope that you'll be able to take some of this content and, and try it out in your own classroom. Um, thank you so much for attending today. If you do have any follow-up questions, please feel free to email me at sarah.mead at ecae.ac.ae. And I want to um, thank the, the conference coordinators so much for the opportunity to present, and I look forward to connecting with many of you. Thank you.